Well, good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRNAM for Tuesday, February 1st, 2022. And our top story today, retirement investing in target date mutual funds bounce back in 2021. Joining me now to discuss this and a lot more, Randy Plavica is a journalist at With Intelligence. Randy, happy new year. Great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Thanks so much for having me, Jeff. Always a pleasure to be on. All right, Randy. So LL, LL Cool J always says, don't call this a comeback, but it looks like retirement investing, specifically in target date mutual funds, made a significant comeback in 2021. Yeah, you're absolutely correct there. I think there was a lot more of a big of a bounce back. And I appreciate the uh, the reference outside there uh, to, to a famous uh, rapper, of course, also now uh, actor. But my point is yeah. there, obviously, a lot more investor confidence returning on the retail side and also the institutional side. A lot more people kind of not wanting to be on the sidelines when it comes to retirement investing, want to take a little bit of an advantage of the, uh, at the time, what was really good equity markets, right? I think 2021 did pretty solid in terms of returning back to quote unquote form. Uh, and I think overall, right, a lot of investors that were kind of just holding the course for 2020 and just holding on to whatever cash they could, they realized that, okay, now I can actually return that into a target date fund back into my defined contribution plan, whatever other portfolio holdings I might have. Uh, to your point, right, even investments in class R6, which are low priced uh, retirement shares in mutual funds were way up this year. I think about double uh, from 2020, and I, I believe, uh, uh, you know, total about 42 to 43 billion range uh for 2021 which is really healthy right and really good to see obviously momentum there will be interesting to see how it continues onward but uh, i think so far it was kind of nice to see you know a lot of investors just kind of getting back into the flow of things uh and at least trusting their money on the target date side once more uh after markets kind of stabilized from the 2020 volatility yeah, randy let's let's talk you and i've talked about collective investment trusts and they have really taken i don't know precedence is the right word of course they can be used in 401k and governmental 47. We're not yet there with 403b, but let's talk about the shift there and what does that mean for mutual funds? Are mutual funds going away? At least for retirement sure. investing. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm not sure when they may go away. There, there might be room for both of them to exist. I think we've seen a lot bigger the CITs because of the pricing structure. They allow for a little bit more flexibility, get a little bit lower cost there for a lot of times the same holdings. Uh, you can also do more of a blended approach where you get kind of the best of active management uh, in tandem with really good solid index performance, right? Uh, and so where that comes and helps out is a lot of those small to large DC plans that don't necessarily want to pay, you know, giant price tags just for the sake of like a really good target date structure. They can almost bring that out in a CIT form from whatever asset manager they're using uh, and get a lot of those same advantages. Now on the asset management side, a lot of them have started rolling out more CIT flavors, right? A lot more hybrid approaches, some going all index on CIT and some doing a lot more kind of active mixing in there uh, in between. Uh, the point is, I think the development there is kind of shifting towards CITs where there's a lot more flexibility. Uh, target date CITs are definitely taking a bit more precedence to your point. Um, I don't know at what point they surpass, you know, target date mutual fund assets or just overall just demolish them. Uh, that being said, I would not be surprised to see a wider shift to that in the future. And those assets will largely go from mutual funds to the CITs. I don't think they're going to flee and go elsewhere. But my point is, uh, you know, if I had to put a timestamp on it, I probably couldn't. But I'm sure there's a lot of CIT providers out there that are hoping for the next three to five years for that kind of parity to be achieved. Yeah, there's a big investment, as you said, in the asset management industry and CITs. But I don't mean to say that, and for anyone who's a retirement investor not in a 401k plan or a retirement plan, it doesn't mean mutual funds are going away. Uh, they're, they're probably still going to be around. They've been a great vehicle for what the last 60, 70 years. It's been, they've been in existence for a long, long time, but look, Randy, we, we, and we had Kim Weaver from the federal retirement thrift investment board on last week, talking about the decline in fees at the TSB. That's kind of the gold standard 4.3 basis points. So I have to think that fees are still top of mind for plan sponsors. Absolutely. Right. And when it comes down to fulfilling your fiduciary responsibility and making sure you're not liable to uh, any sort of lawsuits or regulation of that accord, right? You want to get the best price for the best performance on a lot of times CITs offer that. And, you know, considering all these things and above, right, people still want kind of like retirement income features. And I think mutual funds can thrive on that side where you can kind of add those capabilities onto a traditional target date mutual fund 
CIT is obviously it's probably more room to be figured out at this point in time. I've not seen a traditional, you know, target day CIT offering with like bespoke retirement income yet, which isn't to say that it's not inbound. I'm sure there's a lot of asset managers working on that and a lot that are either already have that capability in house, but maybe don't directly advertise it or can do it in a custom setting. Right. But I think to your point, I agree. You know, a lot of time is going to come down to price uh, because they can kind of get a flavor of funds anywhere else in the world. So they want to go, OK, well, who can give me the best deal? Uh, on this basically DC plan structure that I know all of my investors are going to like, whether I'm a plan sponsor, an advisor, a consultant, or beyond. Yeah, well, that, as we talked about with you, there's a lot of innovation. It includes mutual funds. It includes income. It includes ESG. It includes a lot of different things. Randy, I need to take a quick break, and maybe we'll get LL Cool J to join us in the quick break. When we come back, ESG investing has really led to a surge in hiring of ESG talent. You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses. I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you stuck with a low credit score? A credit report and score that's causing you to be denied credit or pay higher interest rates than others for the same things? Then do what Terrence did and call Credit Repaired for your free credit evaluation to help restore your credit. I started thinking about buying a new house and my score wasn't where I needed it to be. I called and spoke with one of the representatives and we just had a good conversation and I, I liked what he was saying. Just one call for his free credit evaluation was all it took to start back on the track to repairing his credit. I'm seeing the deletions and I'm getting the report so I know something's being done. It does make a difference to me. All it takes is one call to get started. Credit repair has given me a second chance to have a better credit score. Don't let a low credit score hold you back another day. Do what Terrence did and make the call for your free credit evaluation. Call 800-819-4152. That's 800-819-4152. Again, 800-819-4152. Welcome back. We're talking to Randy Plavica of With Intelligence. Randy, thanks so much for staying with us this morning. Glad to be back on. Thanks again, Jeff. Yeah, and, and uh, haven't heard from LL Cool J, but uh, hey, look, if he wants to appear, we'd love to chat retirement and savings with him. All right, let, Randy, we have talked about this ESG. In fact, we talked about it last time. ESG is a big flavor. Uh, there's a surge in ESG investing not only here in the States, but abroad, and that has led to a surge in finding professionals, asset managers finding professionals. What, what, what do you have to say on this topic? Yeah, I think the talent hunt for ESG uh, specialists, leaders, you name it, anything you want to tack onto their title uh, is pretty hot right now in the sense that I wouldn't be surprised if it's one of the more in-demand things to have on your resume these days, whether or not you've actually built out the ESG products or you are just building out kind of the analytics and tools being used to enable ESG investing. Uh, we've seen a lot of poaches in recent kind of, uh, we'll call it quarters, but especially in recent months uh, of ESG, top ESG specialists 
going from firm to firm, heading up new ESG operations at firm A after running firm B's for quite some time. Uh, and what it's done is it's made development, I think, a lot more interesting, right? There's a lot of asset managers that were never really in ESG investing before that are now picking up leaders from elsewhere in the industry that they are then going to build you know, ETFs, mutual funds, and maybe even potentially retirement products uh, on the backs of their hiring, right? And all of a sudden, it gets a lot more interesting from my perspective when I'm trying to keep track of who's going where on LinkedIn, and it's just a snowstorm, like an absolute flurry of, oh, God, I can't believe this person's at Asset Manager B now. Weren't they just building out this at Asset Manager A? Um, that being said, it does ultimately benefit the investors, right? Because a lot of these firms are actually investing uh, time, money, resources, and now talent to back it up uh, in order to give kind of that flavor investing to everybody. Um, some interesting interesting stuff we've seen, right? And this was a pretty notable departure, but CalPERS, one of the largest institutional plans, lost their ESG leader to go work at an asset management shop to head up ESG product development there. And that was probably one of the more interesting moves that we saw, right? Especially because it impacts a 400 billion some odd uh, retirement plan. But at the same time, it really shows that asset managers are looking not only in the industry, but also just in and around all the crevices, whether it's at an investment shop, uh, at an investor itself, or elsewhere. I've even seen people come from, you know, uh, what I'll call outside groups as in companies that aren't even necessarily in the asset management realms or an investment realm, just to get that ESG flavor brought in. So all that being said, it's gotten really interesting. Yeah. I mean, there is a Florida town and great analogy or metaphor from you because it was snowing in the Northeast. I know there's snow where you are in Brooklyn, but uh, what are the qualifications? I'm just trying to figure out, look, I, I get that this is, there's a surge and, um, I'm just trying to understand what the qualifications are. Like, how would Jeff Snyder, uh, how would he beef up his resume or what would he need to do in order to be considered for ESG? I mean, is it a certain, uh, you know, certain CV that you have to have, a certain chops that you have to have, a gravitas? I think it's a bit of uh, a bit of both, but I would say that honestly, it doesn't even take, I wouldn't say a deep roster of experience. I, I know it does take experience, but I've seen people with one to three years of bespoke experience doing ESG investing, getting these pretty leading roles elsewhere. And a lot of times it just comes down to their kind of personal involvement with the investing style and also just their personal interest in it. Uh, you know, if you're really passionate about having like a, a fossil fuel free portfolio uh, or you're running kind of thematics in that range, right? If you're running a, a renewable energy ETF, that pretty much puts a really good kind of green stamp of approval on your resume, on your CV that otherwise would not be had. Um, it's pretty interesting. I don't think you necessarily need to be running a bespoke ESG roster for a firm in order to be ESG talent. I think it just comes with what are your interests, what are your portfolio holdings look like, and what are you trying to design and develop and kind of how are you trying to improve the investing landscape to make it more sustainable uh, in orientation. Obviously, there's still a lot of headlines and maybe not as many assets as a lot of these asset managers would want in the actual ESG funds. That being said, I still think it's a worthwhile investment because you know, sooner or later, a lot more younger investors are going to want to express interest and also put money toward these allocations, right? And I think we see that with younger millennials. We're very much likely seeing that with like Gen Z investors too, right? Where it's going to be much more sustainably geared. So bulking up talent now is I think a safe bet to tap into at least a pocket of those resources later on and those assets later on. Uh, that being said, it's not going to happen overnight, right? I don't think that hiring an ESG specialist will give me a brand new set of funds to run in about a month's time. I think it'll take a year or two before you get a really good suite of options, but obviously still a worthwhile thing to do. I guess while it's fresh, while it's fun, and while uh, the talent is, uh, I guess, easily hireable and maybe even poachable uh, from other shops. So, yeah, I, 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 let's not leave out Gen X either. By the way, Randy, I'm a Gen Xer, and and you know those are those are issues that I care about as well. You know, all kidding, and I know LL Cool J, by the way, cares about it too. Hey, Randy, and we're not just talking about the leadership; we're talking about analysts. Uh, portfolio managers. Uh, we're talking about data, um, how you choose to incorporate ESG or sustainable investing into your investment process and philosophy. So there's a lot of moving parts here. I mean, it starts with leadership. You got to be able to go to COP26 and all these other big events and I guess schmooze with the folks, if that's even possible under uh, in today's environment. But it, there's, a, there's a, you have to build an entire organization of professionals. So there's a lot, a lot of people that I think are going to be on the move. Yeah, no, and I would absolutely agree with that. I think you can't just kind of hope you can retrain an existing portfolio manager to suddenly be an ESG portfolio manager. I do think you need to have those basically analysts on the team 
supplying that information upward. And maybe even if you don't do an entire overhaul of the organization, you really do need to start from the ground up. Um, I think a lot of times when firms hire a brand new head of ESG or a global head of sustainable investing, whatever title they may be granted, right? That's usually a signal that, okay, either A, they were already spending the time and money on building out the ground floor of the ESG team, or B, they're about to spend a lot of money doing that, right? Uh, and it'll be interesting to see kind of how a lot of organizations maybe get restructured around that. Um, I've spoken with quite a bit of asset managers that say, you know, oh, well, we already integrate, you know, ESG factors into our processes. Uh, they may not have like a bespoke, you know, branded ESG fund, but they quote unquote integrate it, right? And, uh, to me, a lot of times, you know, there's no uniformity in ESG investing, which is maybe one drawback of it. There's also no uniformity in what quote unquote integration looks like. So whenever I hear that, I think to your point, right, I want to see, okay, well, how many ESG data people do you have on hand? How many analysts, how many like architects are working in the background to make this happen, as opposed to just having one bespoke person who just speaks on it to your point, right, at COP26 and kind of is the figurehead, right? I think it takes more than one thought leader to make an ESG kind of fund manager work. Uh, but that being said, I, I, I would say that, you know, the investment in that sort of talent uh, is not going to stop anytime soon, especially as these offerings, I guess, get more traction and more interest from retail and institutional investors alike. Yeah, well, certainly it's a lot more than a flavor It's, it's and a lot more than a trend. Uh, and we're going to have to see, to your point, how it plays out with institutional investors, especially here in the States, and also with retirement plans like defined contribution plans. Randy Plavica, always a pleasure. Look, we went everywhere on this show with you today. Really great to see you. Thanks so much for sharing your perspective. And we look forward to having you back on again very soon. Thanks so much, Jeff. And that wraps up this episode of BRN AM. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, will drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the information in lifestyle, wellness, tech, finance, so much more in all in one place, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to see our latest content or search our archives? Well, of course, check out our website, broadcastretirementnetwork.com, and our streaming partners like Amazon, Samsung, Roku, and over 100 more. We're back again tomorrow. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Are you being audited? And do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The tax doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a Tax Doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.